our Christ, who was crucified, rose from the dead. Now, Muhammad died and stayed dead. Buddha died and stayed dead. Other key fig figures died and stayed dead. The great rulers throughout history, they ruled, but they died. And their dynasties ended. They wanted, and I've mentioned this before, and hopefully you'll remember it by now if you've been here for any number of weeks. Christ's kingdom came. They expected him to rule like every other human ruler, but he refused to rule like every other ruler because he was obeying the will of the Father and he was having a kingdom that wasn't going to last for a certain period of time that would die out like every other kingdom that has ever been. His kingdom was a kingdom that was going to rule and going to reign forever and ever and ever. Amen. And so the dating system that we have today was inspired by other rulers that is, have, have existed. When they were rulers of the known world, they used to have a dating system that counted. Okay, it's number one year Constantine, number two year Constantine, or whatever ruler was in power at the time, they'd count one year after another. And so when we have our dating system, we are glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ every time we write the date at the bottom of a page. Every time. And you know what? It's there and it's all over the world. The whole world is recognising that the Lord Jesus Christ's kingdom and rule is going on and it's still alive today. And I don't care if the history books say BCE or CE. That cannot erase why those dates were picked because they were picked around the birth of Christ and when he died he did it didn't become 30 or 33 AD and then flick over to a new date the date just kept rolling because he became alive again Hallelujah. he is the king of kings he is the lord of lords no other ruler no other authority no other kingdom could go on like Christ Christ kingdom that we have he didn't come to set up a human kingdom as they expected. He did the unexpected. He did the unexpected. And he drew, drew hearts, not just from a re for region or a territory of the Israelites as they expected. He drew hearts and lives. He in, uh, compelled Gentiles to join in. Simon of Cyrene going on his merry way. A God-bearing man from a Gentile region. I don't think it's an accident that he was compelled you must carry the cross. Oh, right? It wasn't an accident that the centurion, the Roman centurion, proclaimed and revealed the identity of Christ and proclaimed, surely this man was a son of God. He is compelling people to follow him in every country, in every nation, in every region around the world. And he's compelling you and I in this place, in this time, to bow our knee and swear allegiance to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There are many things that their world would want us to throw allegiance to. Follow this process, this policy, bow your knee down to this, that and everything else. But there's one kingdom that we really is, is the most important king to bow our knee down to. And that's before our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Oh, sorry, I'm getting a bit excited. How's the microphone going? Up and down? Oh, I'm excited. I'm excited. Because Jesus is my king. Is he your king? Have you sworn allegiance to him? Have you given your life to him? Have you committed service to him? Yes. Oh, well, we're on the winning team then, aren't we? We're on the same team. And it's not exclusive. Everybody's invited. There was a wedding feast that Jesus talked about once, and he invited all the important people and all the religious people, said, come. And they go, oh, no, I'm a bit busy. I've got a new heifer, and I've got to make sure they're all right. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You can't come to the wedding feast because I'm cow. You've got to attend to? Oh no, I'm busy. I've got to do this or that or whatever else. You see? The parable goes like this. Oh no, 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 no. My wedding feast needs to be full. I'm going to have a celebration. And whether you're there or not, I'm not going to let that dampen it. Go to the highways and the byways. Go and find people anywhere and everywhere. That, you, that person that's despised by society, bring them in. Bring everybody in. We're going to celebrate the kingdom. We're invited. We're invited. 
And we get to choose to celebrate. Some people might not like Jesus. They might not choose to bow their knee before Jesus. They might mock him. They might treat him like a joke. They might hear the gospel and go, that's so unrealistic that someone would die and rise from the dead. Oh yes, and Paul talks about that. The gospel, the message of the cross is foolishness. This is so stupid. To those who are perishing and dying. But those of us who are being saved, and you can feel it in your heart like I can, it's the power of God for the salvation for all, the Jew and the Gentile. This is the kingdom that knows no end. Oh, it's exciting. So what do we do with this? This great king that we have, that we're following, that we know that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord, whether people like it or not. Well, it gives some instructions in verse 15 of chapter 16, Mark 16, 15. I don't know if you can find it. Sorry, Sam, I'm making it really hard for you today. He said, go, you can listen to me anyway, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel, gospel meaning good news, to the whole creation. Look, if you run out of people that don't want to hear the message, tell a rock, tell a plant. It's a good message. Well, it would be funny. If they thought we were foolish before, oh, really? who cares? It's a good message. Verse 16, whoever believes and is baptised will be saved. And whoever does not believe will be condemned. In Mark chapter 8, verses 31 to 34, we're going to go back. We've read, it would have been read here a long time ago as we go through Mark. And it's interesting because people struggled to believe. And when he rose from the dead, they just couldn't believe it. It was too, it was, it was too good to be true. They couldn't believe it. Do, do you hate getting disappointed? I hate getting disappointed. I'd rather set my bar low. And then the more I get disappointed, the more I... Expect less to protect myself. And so when Jesus was crucified, the most agonizing, painful, grievous experience that so many people experienced, when they heard that he rose from the dead, it was news that was too good to be true. But he did tell them about it. From verse 31 in chapter 8 of Mark, or Mark 8, 31, he says, He began to teach that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. They're all the religious folk. They're all the people that were too busy. They didn't want anything to do with him. And that he must be killed and after three days rise again. So he told them explicitly what was going to happen. I'm going to be rejected by all the important religious folk, the elders, the chief priests, the chiefs of the law, and I am going to have to be killed. He said, I have to be killed. I must be killed. And after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. Very unusual for Mark, the Gospel of Mark. Very plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Why? He didn't think that that should be expected. But Jesus turned and looked at his disciples and he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. Now, I should have included, I've been picking on Peter a bit, just before he got named Peter. He was called Simon, got renamed Peter, because he proclaimed, you are the risen, you, you, you proclaim, you are the Christ. The son of the risen God, right? Or well, something like that. And, and he goes, that wasn't revealed to you by man. That was revealed to you by revelation. You're no longer going to be called Peter. Sorry, you're no longer going to be called Simon. Oh, I'm on a roll today. You're with names. You're no longer going to be called Simon. You're now going to be called Peter. Little rock, big rock. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. So he just renamed him. And then... Peter's getting a bit confident. I've got a new name and I'm going to be the leader of the whole church. If we've been arguing down the road, it was the greatest. I guess we know who he is now. Oh, I'm Peter. The big rock. Who's the big rock now? <laughs> but he gets named again very quickly. He got named Satan. He got called Simon. Renamed Peter. Renamed Satan. And he got called... <laughs> Get behind me, Satan. You don't have to mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. But don't worry. God restored him. Don't be scared of being rebuked by God or feeling convicted of your sin and being put back in the right direction. It's because he loves us. He loves us. It's just important stuff. It's not a small matter to be going astray, wandering down the path of death. Jesus might need to snap us into line, get us back on track, because he loves us. If I will see my kids, and they don't do it very often these days, 
But if they start wandering off a cliff or something, as they probably would have done, I'd go, oh, bless you. Oh, oh, oh. That's a shame. <laughs> what? I mean, I should be going, watch out! I mean, I say this all the time anyway. Stop! Yesterday, we were camping at a pier, and there's a big uh, retaining wall with a, quite a few minute drop. And um, their friend came over yesterday, and he was he's in between Isaiah and Silas's age, also a pastor's son. And he goes, oh, my legs are so strong, they can't break, blah, 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 blah. And he's going to jump off this and do a commando roll. But he didn't quite do a commando roll. And now he's got a cast on his fraction bones. <sighs> yes, sorry, you know, yeah, Ben. <sighs> Started so confidently. Then Silas goes, oh, I think I can do it better. I'm like, no! <laughs> I don't want to pass that stage. <sighs> But it's quite appropriate to get severe over severe things. Like if there's severe danger, there needs to be a severe response. And so Jesus stepping in there, he needed to. Because this is life and death. We're not playing games here. We're not. This is the rule that knows no end. We remember we mentioned in Mark, those who believe will be saved, those who will not will stand condemned. We're not playing games here. This is this is the real deal. And then in verse 34 of Chapter 8, it says, Then he called in the crowd. I'm talking about how we respond now to the resurrected Christ. What's our call? What's our response? Then he called to the crowd, him along with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Now, we saw that fulfilled with Simon of Cyrene. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Our call is to deny ourselves and to die. You know, as I mentioned last week and the week before, no one could follow Jesus to the cross. He predicted they would all scatter like sheep. There was one person who was super duper confident. His name was Simon, Satan, or Peter. But no, he only got what say very briefly. Okay, that wasn't his written name. But, but he did say, Simon, Simon, Satan is after, that's after sift you like wheat. He's referring to himself without that anointing and revelation when you're just by yourself. Simon, you're going to be sifted. You're going to be found wanting. But don't worry, I'm going to restore you. So Peter needed, or Simon in that case, needed to see his weakness before he could be released to serve the church for all the mighty, powerful deeds that he did after that. We are called as a people not to be confident in ourselves and in our own life what life we can make for ourselves and how happy we can make ourselves and the best retirement plan we can come up with ourselves. Our call is to deny ourselves and follow our king. Yes. He, is he really the king or is he our little label that we put on the side of our life? What brand are you? Oh, I like the Christian brand. That's the thing on the side of my life. No, that's not what, it's, what we're called to be. I know that our culture in the West, we rely on so many things and we can lean on our finances, our money, our careers, and we even make decisions on how we might want to follow Jesus. Mm, maybe I'll do this, or that, or whatever. Don't even bother consulting the king. In what kingdom do people go, oh, what would you like to do? Mm, I think I might, you know, be the court jester. Okay, but you're not very funny. Oh, maybe, you don't get to choose. I couldn't think of any roles on the, on the spur of the moment. You don't get to choose what you do, you just serve as a heart of service. And you know, do you know what the cool thing is? God gives you gifts and abilities to serve. And the thing is, when you start serving him, even if it seems not fun at the beginning, you get that fulfillment of serving the king, using the spiritual gifts or whatever gifts you've got to serve him, and, and it's fulfilling as well. But we don't do it for fulfillment. Serving and being humble before him is fulfilling. We don't become a Christian because it makes my life better. 
We become a Christian because we want to be worshippers of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And it's interesting because I said this, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. So if I'm trying to find the best life for me, I'm going to lose it. How many people are going around absolutely miserable in life? They're trying this worldly thing. They're trying to follow all the promises that they can have a great life in this world. That If they're in America, they might be following the American dream. Whatever dream or facade they're going after is not fulfilling and not working. Worshipping ourselves is not what we were designed to do. And we end up in a spiral of hopelessness, never able to fulfill what we were always called to do. And that's to be worshippers of our Heavenly Father. And we are called to be part of His family. And, it's, and to get there is not to worship ourselves. That actually makes us further away. Right? And the problem is with all these religious folk, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they were worshipping themselves and having a label of their religion. And nobody would have known. Judas was indistinguishable from the other 11 disciples. He went out, he did miracles, he did wonderful things. Nobody had any idea that Judas was being selfish and worshipping himself and taking money from the money bag. Nobody knew, but God knew. And gee, that worked out well for him, didn't it? He had all the gifts and abilities as an apostle of Christ to set up the church of the world. It didn't work out too well. He ended up committing suicide in absolute hopelessness and misery. He found no fulfillment in worshipping himself. As Christians and as God's people, let's not lie to ourselves and use this Christian thing because it makes my life better. I don't care what doctrines are out there. That's not what we're called to be. We're called to be servants of our almighty living God. We get to serve. We get to worship. And as we empty ourselves and come humbly before him and bow our knee before him, we find life. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. And I have found life in Jesus Christ from serving him. I have had many challenges and sometimes I have said no to God and it hasn't worked out too well for me. But every time I've said yes, there's that satisfaction that I am serving my king. He's my king. He's also my father. He's the one that can demand things of me like he said to get behind me. He says to Simon Peter when he's out of line. As a father... If my, one of my sons, they're feeling a little bit like they might want to be the alpha male, I have to show them that they need to get behind me, <laughs> underneath me, into the ground. I don't know. No I need, do you think it's good for any of my three sons to have authority over me in my household? No, no they need to know who the boss is. But I'm also their father. And I love them. And I'm just an earthly father. But I do a pretty bad job a lot of the time. I get tired and grumpy. But our Heavenly Father, He will put us in the line. Because He is the King of Kings. But He also loves us so dearly. And that's where we belong. We belong underneath His authority. We belong as a child of God. And that's what we do when we respond to the risen Christ. We swear allegiance in the truest sense from the deepest place in my heart. Not because I have to, because I don't actually have to. I don't have to be a Christian. I don't have to have Jesus as my Lord. Now I know Christendom, which is a different word, that calls nations Christians in history gone by. They said, we are um, in England the people were just like, what are we? We are Catholic. And everyone go, okay, we're Catholic. Cool. We are now Church of England. And the whole nation goes, all right. There were some extremists like, no, oh, we want to be this or that. And they fought for, you know, the Bible to come out. But for the vast majority, people just followed whatever the, the king said. Because actually, they were their king. Their religion was like, I oh, just whatever they are. Scotland became the Church of Scotland. So everyone was a Presbyterian because that's, you're in the country, that's what happens. I think it was Constantine or somebody, he would have all these converts because he would throw water, or just go, everyone walk through the river. Okay, we're all baptised, we're all Christians now. People are like, what are we doing? I don't know. 
there's this kind of Christendom mentality that still exists today, where what are we? I'm a cultural Christian. No, I don't have to. I'm not forced in God's kingdom to worship Him and swear allegiance to Him. I get to choose that from my heart. The two greatest commandments is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Because as God's kids, we're very loved. But we can just express that to others. And as we are graciously forgiven through the death and resurrection of Christ, we can forgive others. I say that, and I know I struggle with that. <laughs> I'm going to have to do, I, I have to deal with my heart all the time. Because I, I, I can receive it, I can, but it's harder to afford to die because it's not fair. Just stay out of it, God. Let me deal with it on a human level. And then you, you face the cross and you realise, oh, I'm called to forgive and to love. Oh, the kingdom that knows no end. Our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. I don't know. If, if Judas got away with what he got away with, I would have no idea where everyone in this room's at. Like, but you know, or if you're lying to yourself, God can reveal it because of his incredible grace. We're going to have communion now. And I pray that if any one of us is caught up in some kind of traditional religious experience on the outside, and you know there's something wrong on the inside, I would have no idea. You have the opportunity to make your life right with Him. There might be people that have never associated with Christianity. You weren't brought up Christian, whatever. I'm telling you today, you can receive Christ in your heart. It's, it's, it's the most costly thing that's ever occurred on the face of the planet. That God would leave almighty heaven, come as a, in the form of a man, get abused and tortured and die for the sins of other people. He was incriminated for your sin, for my sin. Very, very costly. And at the same time, freely given. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever, whoever, I don't, whatever your background is, however good you've been, however bad and sinful you think you are, it's not more powerful than what Christ did on the cross. Whoever believes, not just intellectually, puts their belief in what he has done for our sin, shouldn't perish, but have everlasting, or in some version, eternal life. And some people have already in that place now. It's sad, but it's exciting for them. Why don't we, if, who's on communion? If we can hand out the communion now. And let's our, assess our own heart, right, in sober judgment, in humility, right? If you don't want to accept it, what Jesus has done, oh, thank you, Mark. You don't have to receive it. But if you want to step out by faith, it's not an initiation ceremony process, seven-step thing. It's literally just, I don't understand everything. You don't have to. But... I, I do want to respond to you, Lord Jesus. I receive this by faith. Not by works, not by how good we are. I receive this by faith.
if you would like to, and you're all invited to, because that's what God said, to accept the death of what the sacrifice he has made for us. Let's eat it as a symbol of just accepting humbly his sacrifice for us. Father, we are so sorry. We come to you as an unclean people with nothing of value to give to you. You're just in awe of what you have done for us. Your love is so powerful, it's almost it's, it's intimidating. It's, in a give and take world, we, can ne- we can't give you anything back of any value. But you ask for our lives in exchange for yours. And so we give them to you. And as we drink this juice, we remember your blood that has covered all of our sin. Lord, if there's people that we need to forgive, help us to forgive. Help us to live abandoned for you, not for ourselves. We don't have the strength to carry a cross and follow you, but you did it for us. And by your grace, we believe we can follow you all the days of our life. You give us strength. You give us life. You fill us with your spirit. So, Lord, as we drink this, just release us from all our insecurities, all our worries, all our troubles. And we accept the great promise that's found in your blood. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's drink together. The moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun was dead. You can stand if you like. The saviour of the world was for them. His body on the cross. Feel free to give as well as we worship. <laughs> His blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him. As heaven looked away, the Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in the grave, the war on death was waged, the power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake. The stone was rolled away, his perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated.
stone was rolled away, his perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. No matter what anyone says on this earth, we know that that is true. And Lord, we choose this day and every day that we will serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, not with our own strength, but with the strength that you have provided for us. We thank you, Lord God, that you are our King. You are a good King. We thank you, Lord God, you are our Father. And we pray that we would go forth in the victory of Christ, Today and every day, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, have a blessed Resurrection Sunday and just live in that victory and favour. We should be the most confident people on the face of the planet because our King is alive. He's alive. And He will rule and reign forever. Amen. Amen.